for all you geeks, if you were looking close at the reflection going backwards, looking over here, you'll see there's a bucket and there's a tall cylindrical camera that's sitting on top of a bucket. If you're a geek, you know that that's a Logitech Orbit Sphere camera. <laughs> and that's how I record videos. Praise the Lord. Say, I hope you don't mind, but uh, I'm a little hungry. So I decided to bring my, my lunch. Okay, maybe it's my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Sometimes I get all those confused because they all seem to blend together. So praise the Lord. I hope you don't mind that. Yum. You see, we had... Mm. We had spaghetti. And, uh... The other night. It was alright, you know. It was your normal American spaghetti. You don't go out... Get a can of this, a bag of meatballs, you know, throw it all together and slop it all up. And, you know, if my wife didn't hate mushrooms, I'd have mushrooms in it, but, you know, slop it together and kind of eat it, you know, and we ate it and, you know, scarfed and <laughs> acted like Americans, you know. Oh, man, do I need gas? I need to, you know. But the point is, is it was fun. It tasted good. But there were leftover noodles. So, then... Mmm... Ambulanza. <laughs> then I took my leftover noodles. Because my wife already took some, so I waited to see if she was going to take some to work. So she already took her noodles out of it. You know, so... The rest of the noodles, haha. <laughs> I said, oh, baby. I got some chopped up tomatoes. And so, little cherry tomatoes that are growing in our upstairs, upstairs patio, where this year we grew tomatoes, cut them up, I threw them in, it was nice and chilled spaghetti noodles, so, mm, just the way I like it on a hot day, cut up the tomatoes real small, you know, sort of, cherry tomatoes too, and cut them up, put them in, grown in our garden. Took some olive oil, which I love, olive oil. Sprinkled, you know, semi-liberally, you know, just kind of pour it in, you know. Looked in there and stirred it all up and then threw in a bunch of garlic salt, you know. You know, and that, mmm, because I'm always craving salt. Must have to do with the Pepsi I drink. So I took the salt, you know, and I threw it in there. And the garlic salt, you know, was powdered, you know, with, you know, California, California garlic salt, you know, where it has the extra, I forget, can't think of what it is right now, you know. And so then I took my Johnny's, you know, and then I poured it a liberal uh, portion on top of that, too. Ooh, yeah. My MSG. I got some Johnny's that has MSG. Thank God. Man, I need my heart stimulant, you know, I'm getting old, so I like MSG. And part, quite frankly, I'm tired of you people that can't handle it. I want mine. So I put that in there, you know, and stirred it up, you know. Oh, man, making me hungry just talking about it. So I threw that in there and... Mmm. Then I took this big old thing of pepper and... Threw a bunch of pepper in there. Took my big old spoon and stirred it around, and stirred it up, and mixed it all up. And, hmm. And then the coup de gras. I took my Parmesan cheese and I threw it on top, you know. And then I say, hey, hmm. It's a summer meal. It's also known as bachelor cooking. <laughs> Most guys know how to cook. If they haven't, they need to learn. 
Usually you throw anything together, you put enough spice on it, hey, you can eat it. <laughs> mm. Just so happens. I was a short order cook for a period of time, and I also worked in a restaurant for a long time. So I know a little bit about cooking. But God, in His mercy, saved me from myself by giving me a wife and by giving me the opportunity to learn how to cook and how to develop and how to use things that were right here available to me. And that's kind of what God does when His grace has been made manifest to you. He uses what's around you to speak to you according to His mercy. Because you see, nowadays there's this great deal of condemnation that's in the world. You see, Christians are getting frustrated at the world. They don't feel like they got it all under control anymore. So, whenever you get a bunch of Christians together that are frustrated, they start coming up with doctrines and dogmas. and Sometimes they'll even throw out some legalism, you know, to make you feel like you've got to do something, you know, works of righteousness, you know. When they do that, Whenever Christians don't like what other Christians are doing, they start inventing rules and they start using new kinds of terms you can't find in the Bible. You know, like true Christians, as opposed to false Christians, there are true Christians. Hmm. Mm. Man, this is good. Mm -hmm. But you know, God's funny. And by the way, that's what, in case you hadn't seen this video series before, video grace, what we're studying is why grace changes things with Chuck Smith. We're studying about how, what, and with this whole idea of grace, what it is, what it isn't, how it is, what it is, what God's going to do with it, how God's going to change you, and how people really don't grasp the fullness of grace because they get into defining it, you know, like I just told you, and they don't like what's going on in the world, or sometimes they don't like what's going on in Christianity. So they have to come up with these terms like true Christian, cheap grace, expensive grace. Um, sanctification you know terms they never would have used when you first got saved because you wouldn't put up with it but whenever the world doesn't like or whenever the world of Christianity Christendom meaning Christendom is the entire kingdom of Christians that set themselves up with their own little fiefdoms in these little castles that they create to regulate and to relegate to the entire body of Christ. Their rules for living in their fiefdom. And that's the way it works. Christendom has fiefdoms and kings and people that are setting up their own little kingdoms thinking they're doing it for God because they're not doing it with God but they're doing it about God because they don't know that they're really setting themselves as, up as gods. Whenever you see things that are really resisting grace that's usually what it is. One Christian somewhere frustrated at another Christian. And the weird thing is they're both probably saved. They're just having a toe day instead of a hair day, you know, or a nose day instead of a foot day, or maybe an arm day instead of a heart day. It's one of those things. You learn to deal with it if you deal with the entire body of Christ. Now, if you have to deal with it specifically in your own church or your own life, then you really need to appreciate and understand what grace is and how God has given it to you so that you won't be caught up in legalisms or caught up in places where God doesn't want you to be. And that's why... 
I like what I make. You see, I know what I like. So, what I do is I get some of the ingredients that I have left over. Mm. And I know how to take leftovers. Oh. And make them from what they were, the spaghetti with tomato sauce and meatballs, with some cheese sprinkled on top, and Parmesan cheese. Mmm. Into a garden fresh salad. Perfect for a hot day like today. Just oozing and dribbling, you know, a little olive oil. Oh, just smelling of garlic. <laughs> Ooh, just red as can be with a little tiny cherry tomato grow to my garden that tastes both sweet and tomatoey at the same time. Oh my god. Mm. Mm. I know what tastes good. Mm. That tastes good. That's what Grace is like. Grace can take what was and make something out of what it was into what it could be if God is allowed to put the ingredients in in the right flavoring, the right order, and the right timing. So you see, a lot of people may not completely comprehend in their religion, in Christendom, in their own little fiefdom, what grace is. And they may use it cheaply, or they may use it sparingly, because they want to cause or create some type of godliness that they want in their own little fiefdom that may be different than the other kingdom that they see you know, across the way with their own little king. But for most of us, Grace is what saved us. So if you're saved by grace, then you ought to live by grace and you ought to move and exist by the grace that God has given you so that you could give to others the same grace that you've received. Because you see, when you come before a king in the old Arthur days, you know, when you said, Oh king, you know, by your leave may I enter your presence. And by your leave was asking for the king to extend his scepter that he would accept you in his court, accept you to come forward, allow you to even speak and address him. Because like the one childhood's, you know, Alice in Wonderland, off with his head. Literally, if you were there and you weren't supposed to be, the guards in the court would terminate you. So it was by grace you were able to appear before the king in the medieval days. But we've been given grace that we could appear before the king every day. And that's what frustrates a lot of Christians right now. You see, they're frustrated because Jesus said Gentiles are kind of funny people. He said, look out in the world. You got Gentile nations running around everywhere. Gentiles love to exercise authority over one another. Gentiles have to put someone in charge. Gentiles really like the political process because they like to get involved in being in charge, putting people in charge, and making people obey that they which they say and the things that they are put in charge over. She said, don't be that way. Don't be like the Gentiles.
He said, if you get it. If you get it, be like me. Don't exercise lordship over one another. But he that would be greatest in the kingdom be the servant of all. Step down, don't step up. In Christianity today, we don't see servants. We do see a lot of people in charge and we call them pastors and elders and deacons and ministers and all these guys that are in charge of something. They are in these offices and they say they're in charge and then they say they serve as they are in charge. Kind of like how politicians say that. They're here to serve the people. Really? How's that working out for you? God knows in the latest elections I'd say, yeah, they're serving somebody. <laughs> Boy, are they serving somebody. But no offense to you, but I think you got served. <laughs> and that's the way God wants you to realize and recognize that it's grace that saves you, it's grace that you want to live by, and it's grace that you should operate under. And so, we've been studying this thing of grace, you know, so we wouldn't get caught up in all these little fiefdoms and kingdoms of the world, you know, and kingdoms inside of Christianity, you know, and all these dogmas and doctrines and theologies that people play around with. But we just read and study and enjoy the goodness of God as He provides for us. You know, taking leftovers and making something good out of it. That's what you are. You're a leftover. <laughs> and God's making something good out of you. As wonderful as it is, forgiveness is only half the story of the gospel of grace. There are many people who believe God has forgiven us in Jesus Christ. Where they have trouble is the second half of the good news. That just by believing in Jesus Christ, God accounts us righteous. Not everybody believes that. Not by a long shot. Various groups have established standards of righteousness, yet they seldom agree on what those standards should be. Have you run into that? Have you run into that? You know, I mean, you got saved, right? You know, God saved you. You are saved, aren't you? Did you give your life to Jesus? Did Jesus say you're saved? I mean, come on. Did you read your Bible and God told you and God spoke to you in some way? God gave you his spirit and you're saved? Well, then you're righteous. Aren't you? Now, Remember I told you about those frustrated kingdoms? All those frustrated kings? All them running around, telling everybody what to do, this thing or that thing? You know, wanting to make their own little kingdom? Their own little territorial area? Of trying to make a halo here or something expertise but the gospel of grace according to what we know it to be means that God has made us his righteousness we are made his righteousness in the sight of heaven and earth and you may not look like you're righteous at this point in time you may not feel like you're righteous. You may not even think that being righteous is correct because you may think that your standards aren't being met. And so you're looking at what you think you understand. But you see, God said something interesting. He said, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. He said, I have a different way of thinking. And you went, yeah. Because I'm God, right? Yeah. 
I know the beginning from the end. Yeah. Hold on, I'm having a godly thought. So if I'm God, and I know the beginning from the end, I know what you're going to do, don't I? Well, I think you do. Well, do I know the beginning from the end? Well, yeah. But you're not in the beginning of the end, are you? Well, no, I'm kind of in the middle. I hope. So, I'm God, right? Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, your life's already over. Well, no, not if I'm talking to you. As far as I'm concerned? Well, yeah, I guess if you know the beginning from the end, God, then you already know what I'm going to do. How I'm going to act and what's going to happen in the end. Because you wrote that down in the Bible. And you told us some things of what's going to happen in the end. So that way we would know that you exist outside of time and that you know the beginning from the end. Okay, so yeah, God, you, you know the beginning from the end. Okay, good. You're catching on now. I'm God, you're not. Sorry, God. So I know the beginning from the end. I know what you're going to do then and in the future. Do you think I should plan according to what you're going to do? Hmm. Yeah. Well, since I know that you're going to do these certain things, and I know how you're going to operate, maybe I could plan whether you're saved or not. Maybe I could plan for your salvation and know that you would make those choices and that I can say to you, since I know you're going to be saved, you're righteous. You can't do that, God. You'll violate your own laws. You'll, you'll, you'll say that you know a sinner that hasn't accepted you yet is somehow righteous because you happen to know that he's going to become righteous. You're right. By grace are you saved. Not according to your works of righteousness that you have done, but according to my mercy, I saved you. You didn't have anything to do with it. But God, I... God, I don't understand that. No, you don't. And you see, that's the problem with what people try to do. People that aren't God are always trying to play God because they're Gentiles. You can always tell a Gentile because he wants to be in charge. Now, if you don't want to be in charge, you're not a Gentile. Maybe you're a Jew and you're serving the law. <laughs> or better yet, a son of God. But when you seek to be in charge, you're acting like a Gentile. When you seek to tell someone about salvation if they're saved or not, you put yourself in God's place and you act like God and you're not. Mm. When you take grace and try to make it into anything other than God's mercy and forgiveness, What are you doing with God's grace? What are you doing with what God says is righteous by making it unholy? But He is unholy. Yeah, he is. Right now. Maybe God can see the picture bigger and better than you can. Maybe God can see the beginning from the end. Maybe God knows what 
is going to happen in that man's life or that woman's life or that child's life that he could arrange to such a place that they will choose to follow him on the days of their life. Maybe at some point in time they may ask God even with a dying breath to be saved. Maybe. But you see, that's what the difference between grace given, grace bestowed, and grace defined is. When God bestows His grace, no one can take it away. When God says, come before me, as a king does in the kingdom, in the fiefdom, and extends a scepter, no one can stop that person from coming forward. No one can stand between the king and that person. Because it is by the leave of the king, by your leave, O king, or by your mercy, O king, or by your favor, O king, he presents himself before the king. And while he's before the king, no one may interfere or interrupt. So, you see in studying grace, there are kings and people out there that are frustrated, that are aggravated, that are frustrated by grace because they don't want it to be what it really is. Because they want to make someone become more righteous than they are when God has already given them His righteousness when Jesus died. He imputed to them the righteousness of Jesus into their life. He infused into them His righteousness by the Spirit of God that that transfusion of God's righteousness into an unrighteous subject will make that person righteous and they shall be saved. They that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved because God has an unbelievable transfusion that's called His righteousness. And His righteousness is imputed unto us by the sacrifice of His Son on the cross, on the altar of God's love that was shed for us that we could be filled with that transfusing power of the Holy Spirit through the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from sin and presents us faultless before the Father with exceeding joy that His righteousness because it's a transfusion from godliness into ungodliness has become our righteousness and we are righteous before a holy God and accepted in His sight that's grace and that's how you're saved